morning, no glasses, no beverage, no food in the room, please.
So thank you for coming to our workshop. And I think now people are like getting coffee or get a lot to get here. So uh, we can just wait for five or ten minutes, then we will start. Thank you. So we will start our, um, after more five minutes, waiting for some people. Thank you.
So, uh, Hiro, are, are you ready for online moderator? Um, no, actually, uh, I, no. Sti still work. <laughs> yes, we are not sure uh, how do we connect to remote, particip yeah, remote participation, so. But the thing is, website is down, so uh, I think okay. um, it's a little bit difficult to attend uh, uh, this meeting yeah. from remote <laughs> because they don't have a link to uh, attend this meeting. So I think yeah, it's exactly. okay to start the meeting. I yes. Uh, so um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to our workshop. Uh, this is the workshop um, three to four, the free open internet is for every stakeholder. Um, I'm an organizer of this workshop, Mariko Kobayashi with, uh, from the America Link and also Keio University. So um, yeah, let's start. So um, we are still waiting for um, one more speaker, but uh, we're gonna start. So um, the background of the issue is the uh, the internet is the one of the best platform to challenge the new things and creating new um, business idea at any time. And uh, also, our, the free and open internet is important to um, accomplish the uh, SDGs, like the series of all development goals. Oh, it's coming. However, um, with the growing number of the blocking or filtering and also internet shutdown, like interf interference on the internet by some government's policy, uh, now the freedom on the internet is now threatened. And uh, also, um, the Sanya will um, talk about the register freedom on the net report later. But the problem here is that when people discuss the, like, the internet shutdown, net neutrality, and also the internet blocking, the contest, blo contest blocking or filtering, the dialogue between policy makers and our state, each stakeholder can be the negative discussion, like the criticizing each other, like, like can just anti censorship or anti um, blabber. And, um, so therefore, this session will focus on the discussing the appearing the good impact of the freedom and the free and open internet is for um, every stakeholder. And uh, we believe that the positive discussion will be effective way to um, uh, build a multi-stakeholder dialogue between the, each stakeholder and also uh, including governments. And uh, as a result, it will encourage multi-stakeholder discussion on this subject. So uh, this is a um, brief introduction from me. And let's move on to the part one. So part one, um, the, we have four experts from each stakeholder. Then uh, they input the, from the, in, uh, each stakeholder. But um, before that, uh, let me um, explain the discussion, discussion facilitation. So, um, this is an interactive expert session. So, uh, so if you have any question or opinion, you can use your mic at any time. It is kind of open mic style in the technical community, IETF. But uh, so if you have any question or any comment, please um, raise your hand and, and then uh, push this button and connect to your mic. Okay. So uh, let's move on to the program. So uh, firstly, uh, Sanya from Civil Society will talk about the latest report on, on the freedom on the net and also um, the, the, what is the good impact on the civil society of the free and open internet. So let's Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you, and it's a pleasure also to be the first session uh, in the morning because I think that shows your dedication to this subject. Um, 
as Mariko said, my name is Sonia Kelly, and I'm director for Internet Freedom at Freedom House. One of the things that Freedom House does each year is we publish an annual report called Freedom on the Net that assesses Internet freedom in 65 countries. Uh, so each year we publish a compilation of reports on every single one of those 65 countries. And another thing that Freedom House does uniquely is that we grade those countries based on their internet policies. So then we're able to see how countries do in comparison to one another. And we're also able to draw trends to see whether internet freedom is improving or declining globally. Um, We've done this for eight years now, and uh, the latest findings uh, are showcasing that internet freedom has declined for the eighth consecutive year. I think particularly worrying is to know that only 20% of all internet users live in countries with free internet. So they live in countries where the internet is not severely blocked, where there is no uh, widespread undue surveillance over the citizens, or where people are not jailed for spe simply speaking out freely on political and social issues. When we look at the whole range of restrictions, whether that be internet shutdowns or blocking, uh, what we've seen is that they are most likely to happen around election time. And that was certainly the case over the past year as well. So it seems like that in many countries, particularly political uh, players and political parties that want to stay in power, tend to increase the number of blo uh, blocked websites and they tend to institute uh, shutdowns and uh, also promote the information online in order to stay in power. So I'm going to spend uh, a few minutes talking about the top three trends that we saw in the latest edition of Freedom on the Net. And then uh, during the Q&A, I will be happy to talk about some of the, uh, some of the additional questions about multi-stakeholder cooperation and um, other issues that Mayuko identified. So the first trend that we heavily uh, focused on this year has to do with, uh, uh, with online manipulation. Our research over the past several years has documented that online manipulation, whether that be through uh, paid pro-government commentators and trolls, or whether that be through uh, spread of dis disinformation or through political bots, has increased. So as a researcher, when I started looking at these issues 10 years ago, uh, it was mainly Russia and China and Bahrain and a handful of countries who were doing it. But in our sample of 65 countries, about a half of them have employed uh, this method. And although in uh, some countries uh, this happens on extraterritorial level, so we've seen uh, influence of Russia in Western Europe and in the United States, for example, uh, in most places this actually happens within own borders. So it happens by political parties or political leaders who are trying to influence uh, their own citizens and defend their own policies online. So in order to address this issue of manipulation, over the past year, we've seen a proliferation of new laws addressing uh, so-called fake news. And uh, while this is a very legitimate issue that I think all of us are dealing with, uh, particularly problematic for us has been that we saw that in 17 out of 65 countries, we've seen uh, either proposed or new laws that tackle this information in a way that it actually suppresses uh, free speech, particularly political and social speech. And uh, just to give you a few examples, in places like Egypt, for example, a new law was passed under the pretense of uh, combating disinformation, and under this new law, now social media users with over 5,000 uh, followers are now treated as uh, uh, regular media. So I think for some of you in the audience, you might have over 5,000 uh, followers. That means now that if you live in a country like Egypt, you are legally obligated uh, to follow the same laws and you're under the same legal obligations as a media outlet such as the New York Times, of course, uh, without, being, uh, uh, without having a legal team to actually defend you and to interpret the policies that that entails. We've also seen uh, reactions in places like Cambodia, for example, where now websites are uh, required to register with the government. And again, uh, this is also under the pretense of uh, fighting fake news. To then uh, give you a sense how 
these new laws really uh, are displayed in practice, we're seeing people being arrested for their legitimate social and political activity now under the pretense of these new laws. And we've seen that in 13 out of 65 countries that we examined. Uh, I mentioned Egypt previously, uh, which passed a series of laws uh, under, uh, under, uh, under this particular category. And we've then, as a result of that, seen a, a number of people being arrested and uh, tried for multiple years in prison. So, for example, there was a case of Lebanese tourist uh, who was in Cairo, and she published uh, a social media video where she angrily denounced uh, harassment that she received on the streets of Egypt and also in, in taxis and so forth. And she was prevented from returning home. She was arrested, and then she received an eight-year-old or eight-year prison sentence simply for doing that. And uh, uh, her sentence was recently commuted, but only after her father and her attorney were able to demonstrate that she was mentally unstable, again, just for publishing uh, this video. Or there was another case of an um, activist in Egypt who received two year, uh, a two-year sentence in prison, again, simply for complaining about social harassment or sexual harassment on social media. And I think, as a woman, this particularly strikes me in the age of Me Too movement, where in some countries, actually, people are being arrested and women are being arrested simply for complaining of uh, sexual harassment on the Internet. And this is being done on the, under the pretense of fake news. The second area that I want to briefly touch upon uh, has to do with uh, personal data and data protection. So uh, particularly after the Snowden revelations and then over the past year with Cambridge Analytica and Facebook, I think a lot of countries have been taking a deep look at uh, how they can protect their citizens' data. And I think this is obviously very positive, and we've seen uh, GDPR uh, being a very good case study of uh, positive legislation. But what really worries us at Freedom House are examples of many countries now, particularly authoritarian countries, using kind of this uh, very serious concern to pass policies uh, that would make it easier for them to surveil their citizens. One of the tactics uh, that we've seen is then the passage of so-called data localization laws, uh, where, uh, where all data now in particular countries needs to be stored within the borders of that country. And we've seen that in places ranging from uh, China, Russia, Vietnam. Uh, we're seeing proposals uh, to this extent in places like India. And, uh, Again, what, what, what really concerns us is that many of these places have such few checks and balances, and this is going to be uh, abused for uh, political reasons. And finally, the third uh, area that I want to draw attention to has to do with the uh, rise of China, particularly in terms of inter uh, Internet governance and also in terms of new controls uh, imposed at home. So we've seen... Uh, just generally internet censorship in China reaching new extremes over the past year, uh, more so than in the previous years. But also of particular interest is uh, China's export of some of these uh, policies abroad. Starting with China at home, we've seen a new sweeping cybersecurity law uh, under which now com companies must register users under their real names, and they need to immediately stop trans transmission of banned content. Uh, this new cybersecurity law is so vast that there are about two new regulations a day just kind of clarifying how companies and how individuals uh, need to better comply with different provisions of it. Uh, in provinces like Xinjiang, where humanitarian situation is quite dire, we've seen facial recognition being used to target the eager uh, Muslim minority. And we've seen uh, situations where individuals are being forced to download special tracking apps, which would then allow the authorities to uh, track each, uh, their all movements, and it would alert authorities if individuals or if the suspects go within uh, X number of meters away from, from their house or their place of work. And we've also seen uh, new steps in implementation of the social credit system, which will be mandatory and government implemented by the year 2020, but uh, is currently being implemented on the private basis. And 
I think many of us in the Western, in the, uh, in, in the Western Europe and in many other countries uh, are aware, well aware of the credit system where people are uh, essentially graded based on their financial history. But what social credit uh, system in China is going to do is uh, they're going to uh, also assess people not based on their, just based on their financial transactions, but then also based on their online activity. And this, quite frankly, is very scary. But perhaps even scarier is also for us at Freedom House to observe that China has been on so-called charm offensive, and they're trying to essentially institute a new kind of alternative method of internet governance abroad. And the way how this is being displayed is that we're seeing Chinese officials organizing workshops in many countries uh, around the world. In fact, uh, according to our study, in 35 out of, uh, or, I'm sorry, in 36 out of 65 countries that we examined, uh, Chinese officials organized uh, workshops for top officials of those countries. And although we don't really know what perspired in those meetings, what has been particularly of concern is that very soon after these workshops, we've seen countries actually introduce new laws that closely mimic uh, what is found in China. And we saw that with uh, Cambodia and Vietnam, uh, just for example. So uh, where do we go from here? Uh, I think there are certainly a number of steps that uh, different stakeholders uh, can do uh, to uh, work for open and free internet. But I think the key will be that we work together. And uh, I look forward to actually the next segment where we will be able to explore some of those steps. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sayur. So um, this, this our this session is interesting, interactive the expert session, so you can um, you can speak any time. So please don't hesitate to use your mic and uh, tell your opinion. So if you do not have the, any comments, we gonna move on to the Thomas. Yeah, Thomas from Business Sector ISB. Good morning, everyone. My name is Thomas Grob. I work for Deutsche Telekom. I've been there for 10 years. Before that, I was working with the Swiss regulator. Um, when I was asked, I, of course, uh, checked the report and was glad to see that Germany is still considered to be a uh, free country as Internet access is being concerned, according to Freedom House, which, of course, didn't surprise me. I mean. Our business is to transport data and not to not transport data. So um, we make it a very strong priority to not be put into the role where we have to decide what content is legal or illegal. Of course, that may happen. In Germany, the hurdles are rather high until something gets blocked. So. Um, as German operators, it's quite usual that you even contest um, some orders to block content in court until it's decided after a couple of instances. Um, we currently do not have any blocking in place or any such procedures, but I'm sure the next procedures will come. So basically what I'm saying is as a private company, we see our responsibility with our customers and in a competitive market, it's definitely uh, important to sell access to the full internet. You couldn't sell access to a somehow limited or restricted internet and most certainly not according to what the ISP would like to, to have. I mean, having said that, we do not have a policy to push certain contents or certain political ideas. We do not want to be the instance that does any kind of censorship. So I think the discussion today, and, and we've also heard that from the first speaker, is when should governments actually impose such orders? And um, I think it matters a lot on what the general view of freedom and democracy is in a country. But uh, speaking at the IGF, I think we should also tackle the more controversial issues. Now, for Europe, 
We do have a net neutrality regulation that made it very clear blocking is a no-go except in very clearly defined scenarios such as security and of course that is an important topic and a topic or an area where we as a internet service provider also have a responsibility. So for example within Deutsche Telekom what we will do is if we see that one of our users um, has been infected by malware and is for example sending out spam in large quantities we do a so-called sandboxing which means that access is for a time where this infection is happening restricted but of course we want that user to be back online as fast as possible so what we do is we provide them with the tools and with help to get rid of the malware and be back fully online with no restrictions as soon as possible. Um, the other thing that concerns me on a personal level is we had a practice in several of our European subsidiaries, especially mobile only companies, where we had um, a so-called blacklist in place that is provided by the Internet Watch Foundation. The target here being to prevent child abuse material to be distributed and even worse to be used for profit online. Um, we've had no formal decisions but we have had indications when talking with regulators that the implementation of this Internet Watch Foundation list would be seen as a breach of net neutrality laws. So in at least one instance we took that down with a situation where I think that content that is clearly illegal and very harmful um, is now not being prevented from being accessed. So that could be a topic of discussion also in this round and I think I'll leave it at that for the moment and will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. So um, do you have any comments or your opinion? on this topic. So um, please uh, state your name and... Yes, hi, I'm uh, Vasilis Chrysos, I'm from Greece, and I'm a member of a community network. Uh, for those who might don't, not know, community networks are networks that are built from the citizens, and they are maintained and managed and operated by the citizens, and such networks exist in places where telecom, telecom operators do not reach. So in Greece, uh, we have the Incubent, who is, uh, which is OTE, and Deutsche Telekom has bought uh, our uh, Incubent since many, uh, some years now. Um, our difficulty and our problem is that now that it is a private company, we, uh, we cannot get access uh, from our uh, local community network to uh, internet uh, back hole. Um, which means that uh, we have to find other ways to access internet for people who are geographically isolated, but also digitally isolated. Um, so what I would like to ask is, does Deutsche Telekom have um, uh, some, some uh, policy to work with community networks or to facilitate what we do to uh, connect the unconnected? Thank you. Um, let's say we have a standing practice which is not to enforce what is written in most of Deutsche Telekom's contracts that you should not share your access with um, people that you don't know. <laughs> um, and definitely not for commercial reasons. Now I see that community networks do not have the commercial angle most of the time and I was of the opinion that we are not enforcing in any technical way, we're not even monitoring if you are sharing your access. So I haven't heard of a case where we actually um, terminated a business relationship when, when we saw it, it was used for an uplink for a community network. Now, having said that, I also don't think that we are actively facilitating but I'm sure if you reach out and if there is technical problems, there will be um, opportunities to, to get to people to solve them. So 
please reach out and tell us what you need. So thank you for your comment. So uh, we're going to move on to the next. The, the next uh, expert is um, Guy Berger from the UNESCO. Uh, he's from the intern, um, intern organ, intern government organization. So um, please. Uh, thank you, Mariko. And uh, seeing that I work for UNESCO, I welcome you all to this <laughs> UNESCO. Um, the title of the session, as you know, is Free and Open Internet is for Every Stakeholder, with every in capital letters. And so I would just tell you, UNESCO stakeholders, there are 195 states that are the members of this UNESCO organization. Uh, and when this was formed in 1945, the constitution of UNESCO said the following, that uh, the member states should collaborate in the work of advancing mutual knowledge and understanding advancing mutual knowledge and understanding of peoples through all means of communication. Of course, uh, back in those days, the internet wasn't even known. Uh, and to that end, the organization should recommend international agreements as may be necessary to promote free flow of ideas by word and image. Uh, that didn't say sound, but uh, <laughs> I think one could say that sound uh, would include uh, at least audio with words. Uh, but we know also uh, audio includes music. So anyway, so that's, a, that's this stakeholder in the internet, uh, UNESCO, with its uh, interest in advancing mutual knowledge through free flow of ideas by word and image. So a few years ago, UNESCO member states were trying to figure out how the internet makes sense for them as stakeholders, and they came with a concept called internet universality, which was agreed uh, by these 195 member states. And internet universality, it may sound complex, but basically it means internet for everybody, everywhere. And in order to have that internet, which the member states also saw as being extremely relevant to sustainable development, they came with four principles, uh, which are known as the Rome principles, R-O-A-M, not R-O-M-E. And uh, I think these are pretty interesting because it's, uh, R is rights, O is openness, A is accessibility, and M is multi-stakeholder. So R-O-A-M, rights, openness, accessibility, multi-stakeholderism. So to come to the topic here, a free, a free internet and an open internet. So UNESCO, uh, when it speaks about free internet, it refers particularly to an internet that respects human rights because that's what, you know, what, that's the definition of freedom here. Uh, it's not just simply an absence of restraint or illegitimate restraint, it's also that rights are being respected. Uh, so that would be right to privacy, uh, right to, to expression, right to association, and then of course also social uh, and economic rights. So the package of rights is what is seen as important for, for, for the free internet. Uh, openness is defined by UNESCO as open systems, so you have, uh, the internet should be open for, for entry, uh, not a closed system. I mean, that's the beauty of the internet. Uh, so if you have centralized control, if you have blocks, if you have monopolies, this is against the idea of an open internet. At the same time, if you only have proprietary uh, facilities and services on, on, the, on the internet, that's again o against openness. So one of the beauties, of course, of the internet is that it runs on a, mix, on a mixed economy, I, I think you could say, with uh, a lot of open source software, uh, you know, particularly there, but also open educational resources and everything else. So if you say the free and inter open internet is for every stakeholder, for UNESCO, it means a rights-based internet and an open internet. So it's open educational resources, it's open software, it's, uh, uh, and open markets uh, as well. Now, in the other part of this equation, you've got the R or the O, you have also have the A and the M, and I think this is important because the, the A is accessibility, because there's not much point in having a free and open internet if it's not accessible to people. And actually, I do commend uh, Freedom House, because when they assess freedom on the internet, they do look at the accessibility question, which is questions of affordability, for example, questions of infrastructure and so on, to what extent is the internet uh, accessible. And with UNESCO, we also add another dimension to accessibility, which is what we call media and information literacy. 
which means that the internet should be accessible in terms of cost, in terms of language, etc., but also in terms of the competences that people need to really use the internet and use it in a critical, uh, civic way that's going to advance this uh, mutual knowledge and understanding of all peoples and sustainable development. And then multi-stakeholder, which is the, the M, is of course, um, as everybody here knows, we at the Internet Governance Forum, which is about multi-stakeholder participation in trying to make sure that you don't have unilateral decision-making on the Internet, because as soon as you have the capture of the Internet, either by a company or companies or by a government or by governments, then you reduce the Internet, you certainly reduce the, 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 the openness and you risk uh, the question of, of rights and accessibility for that matter. So if you want to have rights, openness, accessibility, you need to have multi-stakeholder practice. So that in a nutshell is, is, is uh, the interest of this stakeholder in a free and open Internet. And perhaps later I can speak a bit uh, more about how does that impact on the sustainable development goals, which uh, Mariko said she also wants me to address. And by the way, uh, we, we have um, some publications here on this ROAM Internet Universality Model. So um, if anyone interested in this uh, publication, uh, they can come to sure. yeah, here after the workshop, this workshop. Okay, so on the, so uh, we have one more <laughs> expert uh, from the African region, technical community, uh, Rarian. So, um, the, uh, you know, the recent years, uh, the African region has lots of the uh, controversial discussion on the internet shutdown. And I think uh, we can, uh, so she can um, input the insights um, from the, so how to build a dialogue between policy makers and the technical community. So um, could, could you? Okay. Um, thank you, Marika, and uh, apologies for coming in late, but it uh, seems I did, miss, I did miss much. I just fell into the guise of things. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Lilian Naroga. I'm from Uganda. Um, today I'm representing uh, the Internet Society. I'm the president of the Internet Society, Uganda chapter. Um, just to give a glimpse of uh, Africa, I think that's where most of the, of the fun is happening when it comes to pushing for an open internet or an internet for everyone or for every stakeholder as uh, this session is, um, is looking at. And um, for those who are not probably so much familiar in, with the situation in Africa is uh, we've had I think the highest number of internet shutdowns. In um, 2016 for instance I think there were about 56 of these internet shutdowns and 26 were from Africa. And um, from the the technical community in Africa has had a bit of push from um, stakeholders, internet users, to, to find a solution to respond to governments. Um, just so you know, the shutdowns, of course, are, are always done by the governments. Uh, they compel the private sector, the technical community, to implement this. And um, in 2017, I think, at the Africa Internet Summit, there was a proposal that was forwarded to Afrenic to have, um, to have um, take down IP addresses of governments that are you know, implementing these internet shutdowns. Of course, as the internet uh, technical community, this was felt that uh, it was a little bit far-reached, far the proposal that came from the community, some of the community members. Uh, one was that uh, even if, yes, we are saying no to internet shutdowns, we want everyone to connect, but if we say that we take down the IP addresses of, um, of governments that are implementing uh, these shutdowns, then this would kind of either further push uh, away people who would be connecting, but of course it will further lead to inaccessibility of, um, of the internet because uh, if you cut off the IP addresses of, um, of the governments, and this, these governments are the ones that are actually providing, they are the ones that are buying the IP addresses, they are the ones that are providing certain services, so you'd be cutting off certain uh, accessibility. But of course, um, most, another most recent trend is the one that we are seeing around uh, taxing uh, social media users. 
and uh, this also kind of you know limits the issue of having an open internet for everyone and we know that in Africa majority of the users of internet users get to first experience internet through through social media platforms like Facebook WhatsApp snapchat and all these other things so when you cut that accessibility you are most likely to prevent other people from you know getting onto the internet or even for people to experience that internet to enjoy other so that once they connect they can enjoy other you know benefits the internet pro provides from uganda where i come from for instance um, uh, just about this year uh, this financial year which begins i think july july 1st we had um, a social media it's a, it's a bill, it's a, an excise duty uh, bill where our government in, introduced, um, I think, five cents, you know, to connect to the internet. And uh, you have to first pay this particular tax for you to connect. If you don't connect, then you're not off. So when you put it in the perspective that majority of the internet users are accessing internet through social media, they first get that experience, then they can use other services, then you're most likely not to have people connect, you know. Um, one, the openness is cut off, the freeness is cut off, and then you have this interesting tax. And um, what's happening right now is um, there have been pushbacks. Of course, uh, technical community has reacted, you know, saying, uh, if I go back to the, the issue of the, the anti-internet shutdown policy that was fronted to Afrenic, the technical community said no. We cannot take this, but from Uganda's perspective, what is worrying is that uh, the technical community is kind of quiet on this, and uh, the stakeholders that we are seeing that are pushing against taxation of um, internet users in terms of, say, social media that you have to first pay to access these particular social media platforms, the technical community is kind of quiet. One reason is because uh, there's the issue of the policies that are kind of um, uh, repressive, that if they do not implement this, they are most likely to face safety fines in, in terms of paying uh, ridiculous amounts of money or having licenses uh, terminated. So probably they're also getting a bite in this because they have to remit the money to government. But also the other trend away from Uganda, we are seeing that we are seeing more and more countries within Africa adopting the policy that was, you know, started in Uganda. Zambia, for instance, also increased, introduced a, a daily tax on internet uh, voice calls. Well, it's around three cents. And uh, all this is, you know, to raise money. And also Kenya has upped its, um, its, uh, per, its um, percentage or taxation on um, internet data services. So all these kind of put service providers in tight positions to how to negotiate with governments because at the same time, it's a, it's a tricky situation because at the same time, they want to raise revenue to feed the government, but they also they want to raise revenue to remain you know, in sustainable business. So there's a bit of a, where do we draw a balance? Which side do we fall? Is it to the users or is it to the governments who are you know, providing us you know, access into the market? So I'm happy to take on the discussion from there. Thanks. Thank you, Rian. So um, from the audience, um, do they have any comments or opinion or just question on this, the internet shutdown or like the dialogue between policymakers, technical committee, and also ISPs? Um, please speak on your mic. Okay, go ahead. Please turn on your mic. Thank you. My name is Benita and I'm from the DRC, Republic Democratic of Congo. And recently we've been subject to internet shutdown. 
with all the political tension that is going on on the country right now, it's always internet shutdown. And we've tried to make noise, but we don't see anything. So I'm wondering, how can we reach the internet technical community? Because it's really a serious issue and we feel like we've been left alone. Um, thank you, Lynette. Uh, I think, one, in Africa, the technical community is actually listening. For instance, if you speak to Afrinic, um, they, are, they know what's going on in DRC. I forgot to mention that, you know, the number of countries where internet shutdowns has happened, you know, Uganda, DRC, and all these other countries. But, like I said, the challenge is We've issued uh, statements, for instance, Afrinic Internet Society has issued statements, and there's this, you know, sort of dialogue. The internet shutdowns, I think the way they are being castigated by the, by the governments is uh, national security, which I had, that is priority number one. And, uh, of course, uh, happening around the elections, I think that happened, you know, I think DRC 2016, we know when there were kind of preparations for elections which, well, have not taken place to now. But then there's also this fear of, you know, for people to, you know, to express themselves because, well, where they're happening, we have this long history of, you know, people who have been governments for forever, like, say, my president, your president, and all that sort of thing. The technical community, it may be a little bit complicated to activate, you know, to, to say that we are going to say no to the shut down. The only success story I can put, for instance, in Uganda was sometime in 2011, government had ordered the telecoms to, the ISPs to shut down internet because there were some demonstrations. And of course, they had cited national security as a concern. However, gov the, 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 they said, no, we are not going to take this, you know, because we don't feel it's something that is in the interest of the users of our services. What has happened between 2011 to now is we've seen a number of legislations coming up and compelling these people to take action where if they do not take action, this happens. And I'm sure the same legislation that, for instance, is in my country is the same that is in your country. Right now, the technical community is in this kind of long-term dialogues, trying to see when we say no to this, how it's going to affect our profitability, how is it going to affect, you know, our, you know, relationship with the governments. And that is where I think, in my perspective, where it is at. However, also, we need to take note that we look at the service providers, who is providing internet access in majority of um, African countries. One is we have I'm sure in your country there's MTN Uganda, there's Airtel, which is from India, MTN is from South Africa, you know, and when you look at that trend, I think there have been internet shutdowns in, you know, in India as well, a couple of times, I think, this year. Um, when you look at other service providers like, say, Vodacom or um, Orange, which is uh, AfriCell, Orange is, you know, uh, a French-based company, they, their laws are kind of they may not implement certain, certain, uh, certain measures. For instance, during the internet shutdown in 2016, people on Africa, which is the version of Orange, did not experience, you know, the blockade. They were able to, they were accessing the services. So it also tells you where the, the service provider is coming from. So if it's within some of the countries, if it's within origin from the continent, like say if we say MTN, which is South African, the legislation may be different and they may be much more probably compelled to respond to the government request than a telecom company that is not uh, based within Africa. But as I can say, the technical community, there's that kind of dialogue. Where do we draw a balance between implementing this and implementing that. And of course, in terms of, say, national security, governments, in their, at times we are thinking, it is valid and they can justify them, can justify this, this uh, reasoning to the, to the private sector. But of course, there are things that 
are currently being blocked, like child sex images, you know, that is being blocked. Right now in Uganda, you cannot access pornography. Pornography is being blocked. And uh, it's kind of, I don't know, it's, uh, it's a very complicated situation in Africa. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Rian, and also um, comment from the audience. So, uh, Hiro, do you have any comments from the online, oh, no, oh, 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 online moderator? Yes. Um, um, hi, everyone. I'm the uh, online moderator of this session, but uh, I've also uh, be part of the technical community, and I'd like to make some quick comments of the technical community. So, uh, as um, uh, we already, we, as we, we uh, mentioned already before, like uh, uh, Nick, every Nick is one of the like uh, uh, the con uh, contact point. But also, I believe that there is a NOG no network operator groups. It's um, that there is to be a, like a regional um, operator group and also na uh, national op um, network operator groups will be available in in your country or in your region. So. Um, and that they had a like technical expertise about uh, how they how do they uh, implement those tech, those each those things and and they know that what what is that uh, i mean blocking is not shutter is not sometimes best but uh, they know that what is the better way to do do that so um i think that they could be a, one of the contact point and also i would like to mention that the internet society and they had a um um, they're now working on the routing security. It's like a, the, uh, ensure that uh, routing is on the internet should be secured and ensure that no one can um, uh, hijack other someone's or else's IP addresses, those things. So I think that uh, you can you can um, take a look with those documents or you can contact to the ISOC as well. So thank you, Hiro. So um, we still, uh, okay, go ahead. Thank you, my name is Patrick Hiselius. I'm a lawyer at Telia Company, Nordic and Baltic Telco. I'm also a board member of the Global Network Initiative, GNI. I had a question to Freedom House, and one of the main uh, conclusions, themes of the latest report was uh, online manipulation, and you said paid commentators from states, for example. Could you put that in context of the um, tool which is mentioned as an alternative for blocking, which is uh, counter-narratives, where counter-narratives should be, uh, as it is uh, stated, be a, an alternative to terrorist propaganda, etc. Can you put that in context of what you explained as a worry for uh, online manipulation, state paid uh, commentators, etc. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that question. So, uh, uh, so state propaganda, whether that be through uh, paid commentators or through a spread of disinformation, is a serious problem. And I think it really is going to require solutions of multiple stakeholders. And I think that's one of the reasons it's so fitting for, uh, for this panel. Um, I think particularly in free societies, you know, there is a push to uh, deal with, uh, with this information with just, you know, posting counter narrative that would then provide a uh, more truthful perspective of, you know, what, what is being said. You know, to which extent that's really effective, I, you know, I, I think it's still questionable. I, I do think that it has effect, but perhaps not as, as much effect as we would all hope that it would. Uh, I think there is, there is an old saying that, you know, by the time truth puts off her pajamas in the morning, a, a lie will travel ac across half of the world. And I think that's pretty much, you know, the state of the fact. So, uh, so w when we look at some of the fact-checking efforts, for example, like we've, we've seen numerous efforts where in order to deal with disinformation, you know, there, were, there are a number of um, NGOs and media organizations who are then, you know, fact-checking what is being said and then they're posting blog pieces or short articles kind of like, you know, disputing, let's say, the, uh, the ver veracity of something that is clearly, you know, disinformation. Uh, but 
we, what we've seen is that people still like to click more on, you know, on this explosive, explosive news, even though if there is a warning that it might not be truthful. So, uh, so I think that's a problem. So for that reason, you know, I do think counter narratives as a concept, you know, it's, you know, it, it's going in the right direction, but it's not sufficient. I think we really need to figure out you know, what it is that compels people to really consume this information. We need to look into some of the psychological, you know, reasonings behind that. Because, I mean, even if we compare this information to nutrition labels, like, for example, you know, people have all the information that certain types of food are bad for them. Like, nutrition labels say that. Yet, you know, people choose to eat bad food. So it's kind of similar to that, you know, uh, right now, there are many tools out there that are pointing out, you know, uh, which information is being false, and, you know, there are counter-narratives dealing with that, but yet, you know, it seems like uh, that those efforts are ha having, you know, much more limited um, effect than we would hope, and I think we, n we need to figure out what the reason for that is. Well, thank you for your comment, and thank you, Sanjay. So um, we have about more 30 minutes for part two, so we're going to move on to the next part. And uh, so before we move on to the part two, um, the, I would like to ask to the, the participants, so uh, what is your uh, stakeholder? Where are you from? The, where are you from the stakeholder? Like, so uh, if you are from the, is, the, is anyone from the government? Oh, a few. Oh, but, oh, there you go. Thank you. So on the technical community? Not so much, but yeah, very a few. <laughs> so business sector is raise your hand. Oh, just one, two, four, oh, three. <laughs> Thank you. So on the civil society, oh, I, I think I'm out. The, yeah, the majority. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, regulator. So it's, uh, I'm sorry. I mean, also regulator in the government is same thing, same state for <laughs> independent. Oh, okay, thank you. So, um, so the the next part will be focused on so how to build a dialogue of, between the so regulator and the policy makers, and uh, we invite the from the um, e commission like on um, the Oliver, and uh, so. I would like to ask you, so, on how to policymakers um, recognize this, the freedom on the internet or the open free internet, like, uh, how do you think the good impact on digital economy? So, hello everyone. My name is Olivier Bringer from the European Commission. Uh, I'm in charge of uh, internet policies and, and the development of the next generation internet initiative. Uh, we'll have a workshop tomorrow, so I allow myself to do a bit of publicity uh, for this workshop. So uh, uh, before explaining how we take into account the, the views of the stakeholders, I'd like to just uh, remind what is our stake, what is our position in the European Commission on, on freedom of speech. So it's a fundamental right. So it is a part of uh, the, the Charter of uh, Fundamental Rights. So this is something we take very seriously. Uh, and it has been our position in, uh, in this forum, but also in general in uh, all internet policies to uh, support an open and free internet. And, and this is indeed very, very important uh, to, to keep this openness of the internet. So the idea is that anyone can connect to the internet, anyone can connect to anyone, and anyone can upload and download the content and the services of, of their choice. And for us, this is very important to allow the, the, the level of innovation that we have seen until now and to make sure that it continues in the, in the, in the future and it brings the social, societal progress and the economic uh, impact, positive impact that, uh, that uh, it, 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 it should have. Uh, free speech is also uh, uh, very, uh, and free access to information is also extremely important. Uh, it's a way uh, the internet has allowed to uh, communicate across border, to confront views. It's a great tool for uh, public and private debate, and we are now going to enter into uh, elections time uh, at the European level. So uh, the internet is going to be one of the key platforms 
to have this uh, political debate ahead of the, of the elections. And it's also a great tool to, uh, to have uh, unfettered access to, to, to knowledge. So in a way, the internet is now a platform for people to get informed, educate themselves, and we want to keep it uh, like that. So we see really uh, openness and, and freedom of, of the internet as one of the key characteristics of, of the internet together with trust and, uh, and, and inclusions. And we have a, a framework to, to make sure that this, uh, this is implemented. So uh, Thomas has already mentioned the net neutrality rules. So in Europe, you uh, uh, end users can have the right to access and distribute the information, the content, the application, and the services of their choice. And there is no possibility for uh, internet access providers to ban, to throttle, or to discriminate. So that's at the level of the network, there is this strong uh, non-discrimination uh, uh, provision. I would also mention at an upper level, at service level, the Electronic Commerce uh, Directive, which uh, has uh, put in place a limited liability regime for platforms. So platforms in, in Europe are not expected to filter content, uh, but they are expected once they get to know that there is illegal content on, that they host illegal content to remove it uh, ex uh, quickly. And this was important, uh, and I know there are equivalent uh, rules uh, in other parts of the world, to um, uh, promote the development of user-generated uh, content and the platforms uh, that hosted them. And I would also mention, I mean, uh, there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of uh, um, instruments, but one, one other Im important instrument is the one we have uh, recent, which is in the final stages of uh, adoption, is called free flow of data. Uh, in Europe, we have free flow of data and GDPR, which foresees free flow of personal data. So th the data can flow freely. And I think this is also a very important basic concept to allow uh, 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 freedom of, uh, uh, of information and, and, and freedom of, uh, of speech. At the same time, we need to uh, um, protect this free uh, and open internet, and we cannot, uh, we cannot allow that uh, illegal and harmful content spreads on the internet or uh, online disinformation spreads, because this would completely ruin the, 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 the type of debate we can, uh, we can, we can have. Uh, so certain safeguards are needed, and we have put in place a number of these safeguards. So I would mention two things. One is uh, recommendation on the removal, the removal, sorry, of illegal content. Uh, so we ask uh, operators on the internet to quickly remove uh, uh, illegal uh, content, have in place clear notice and takedown uh, uh, measures. But also we foresee, uh, and it is important precisely to preserve freedom of speech, uh, appropriate safeguards, uh, and uh, in the form of redress mechanism, in case, for example, the content is, is removed uh, by mistake. Uh, we also foresee that uh, government should put in place effective judicial uh, remedies, as uh, Thomas was mentioning, in case uh, an operator is, is, does not agree with the request to remove certain content. And of course, that there is always human oversight uh, of automated tools. A lot of the removal will take place with automated, is taking place with automated tools, but we need to have uh, 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 human oversight. Another uh, interesting tool is, another interesting instru instrument is what we have done in terms of removing online disinformation. And there we have not followed the regulatory approach, we have followed the self-regulatory approach. So we have agreed last month uh, a self-regulatory code of practice on disinformation for online platforms and the advertising sector. So within th five months, we have managed to put on the table different stakeholders, and they have agreed on a number of principles to make sure that uh, uh, we keep the internet free from uh, online uh, disinformation. Now we need to see how it works. We need to see that it is uh, properly uh, implemented, but it shows that um, we, we can have self-regulatory uh, approach. We can arrive uh, at a free and open internet by collaborating with the, with, the, with the stakeholders. And that's, uh, so that's one way to, to do it. And of course, when we do uh, uh, legislation, we do it uh, uh, together with the, the stakeholders. We organize public consultation workshops. And there is 
debate, uh, we try to have debate at different stage of the policy making process to make sure that the views of all the stakeholders are, are fully taken, uh, taken into account. And obviously, uh, you cannot impose uh, rules uh, without, on, on, which uh, protect, which uh, have so, so important uh, impact without properly involving the, 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 the stakeholders, without properly taking into account uh, uh, their views and how, how to protect uh, uh, their fundamental rights, including uh, freedom of speech. Thank you, Oliver. So I think uh, in this room we have several government people and also the regulator. And uh, I would like to ask um, you, like, so um, when you talk of, when you discuss of the so, for instance, the content blocking or filtering, like, um, like sometimes you have fight with the like civil society or also technical community, or you feel like, like if you would like to like remove a contents or block some contents or block uh, the contents by DNS or by IP address, um, you're, you're gonna fight with the stakeholders. So, what is what do you feel the barrier for? Um, build a dialogue of, between the policy makers and also other stakeholders, if you have any um, experience about this or this year. Uh, thank you. Uh, go ahead, yeah. Uh, actually, forgive me, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not answering your question because mm -hmm. I have another um, thing uh, which is, uh, I think it's important um, concerning the freedom of internet in the EU and uh, this concerns uh, the voting of article 13 in the directive for the single digital market. There has been a lot of uh, discussion about this and uh, this is, for those who don't know, it's a um, provision in the EU law that uh, every single content that is uploaded from every single user in the EU will be censored uh, to uh, scan for uh, copyright infringement, which is, a I think it is a major um, setback in internet freedom. And uh, I would like the opinion of Mr. Uh, uh, Oliver Maggi on that. Oliver, do you have any comments on this? Um, so first, first of all, it's, um, it's not uh, law yet, huh? uh, so the Commission has, pro has made a proposal. Uh, this proposal uh, has been uh, presented to the Parliament, to the, what we call the co-legislators, so the European Parliament and uh, the Council of uh, Member States, and they have made a number of uh, amendments, and the Parliament has uh, recently, back in September, uh, voted uh, on a text which includes a number of, uh, of amendments. But then the next stage will be uh, that the three institutions get together and discuss uh, and agree on the final, uh, on the final law. I think the, uh, in a way I would reply to the two questions, so to your questions and to, you, to the question of Marie, 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 Mariko, sorry. Um, when you use the, term, the term censored, I think it is excessive. I mean, the purpose is not uh, that the platform censor uh, user-generated content. The, what the provision says is that the, the online platforms should, uh, uh, are responsible and should make sure they, they put in place the measures to remove, uh, to take down content that infringes uh, copyright. This is not uh, censorship. This is making sure that uh, intellectual property is being uh, respected. Uh, and again, there are uh, and there will be uh, a number of uh, um, uh, safeguards to make sure that uh, uh, and this is not done fully automatically, but there is human oversight uh, to make sure that um, the, uh, there is redress possibility, etc. So I would say not censorship, but uh, uh, removing uh, uh, content that is illegal, that infringes uh, copyright. And I think this is the, to reply to your question, Mariko, I would say 
I mean, if we want to, to discuss these issues and, and arrive at balanced solution, I think we, we need to have, um, it's difficult, but I think we need to have a dispassionate debate. Mm -hmm. We need to uh, really be, be factual uh, and, and, and try, and that's the best way to arrive at solutions which uh, take into account the different uh, requirements and the different uh, um, constraints of the different, of the, of the stakeholders. So I would say th this is quite important when we, when we discuss such a heated uh, issue to try to put everyone around the table and try to have uh, uh, as dispassionate debate uh, as possible. Thank you. So uh, you have a comment? Thank you. Yes, on, on the same theme of, of uh, privatized enforcement and, and, and the need and the strong need for rule of law where what is illegal or not should not be decided by private entities. I wanted to pick up on the, uh, uh, and, and of course there is a, everyone in the room, I guess, agree, um, I hope agrees that there is a need for action against terror propaganda everywhere in the world. But uh, you talked about um, human oversight uh, and uh, on, on, on what is removed. And I wonder how that fits together with uh, the request for, in, in practice, request for automated takedown. So, how, how, and a one-hour uh, deadline for takedown. How, how does that go together? Human oversight and one-hour takedown limit and uh, uh, automation. Thanks. Oh, thank you. So. Um, So we were, you can reply. Yeah, yep. uh, I mean quickly because I'm not, uh, I'm not following the file, so I, I don't know the, the, the details of how this is going to be, uh, to be implemented, but the idea is that uh, terrorist content is most harmful in the first hours when it is posted on the internet. This is where it spreads uh, the, most, uh, the most quickly. So the idea is to uh, act at this crucial, uh, at this crucial moment and what the, so we are speaking here of a proposal for a regulation uh, that by, by the Commission, so it still needs to be discussed with the uh, European Parliament and, and the Member States uh, to remove very quickly uh, terrorist content and terrorist propaganda. Uh, the idea is that uh, the request will come from a, from a public authority, so it's not uh, notice and takedown coming from anywhere, it comes from a public authority, typically the, the police, so I think there is already a certain sense of, uh, of, of, of trust about the, 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 the request. And, and then indeed uh, we, the purpose is to have it removed within, uh, within one hour and, and it will uh, involve uh, human uh, oversight. I mean it will be, uh, there I'm not, I don't want to be uh, too, too specific because I'm, I'm not a specialist of the file, but I guess it's a request from the police, it is being handled by people on the side of the on the side of the uh, operator, so I don't think it would uh, it would be fully uh, automated. I, I think there is a, a huge human dimension in this uh, removal process. Thank you, Oliver. So I'd like to ask this for the experts in for one. Um, so, do you f feel some barriers for to dialogue building dialogue? with the dialogue of, with, uh, with the like policy makers of governments from your each stakeholder and how do you want to improve if you have if, if you feel any barriers yeah. so from the perspective of civil society we have um, a huge, in, uh, a huge problem in some parts of the world where we've seen this trend of closing civic, closing civic spaces, which means that civil society is being squeezed out of conversations, not just about internet policy, but just generally we've seen governments in much of the world, um, you know, more authoritarian governments, uh, suppressing freedom of expression and freedom of information and freedom of assembly, which means that uh, civil society is not, it's not only that they're not brought to the table, but uh, they are actively uh, 
uh, being arrested for expressing you know, their views. So in this environment where this is happening, then uh, I think like when we talk to activists in some of these countries, you know, they almost kind of laugh at us when we say multi-stakeholder cooperation because they will say, well, like there's no way for me to have access to my government at all. In fact, I'm, I'm lucky if they don't arrest me if I say something critical of government policies. So I think like that's just uh, a real reality that is, uh, that, that many in civil society currently face. Um, I think the second point I want to make is that very often um, different stakeholder groups are being kind of like grouped all together, but there is a huge diversity of interests in each of stakeholder groups. So we see that with, let's say, the issue of net neutrality. Like when you talk about private sector, you know, like you have ISVs having different interests from uh, from you know media content uh, companies, and I think the, the similar thing is in civil society. So uh, so I, I I do think that you know uh, it, it's very important you know to to think about each stakeholder group as being diverse in its own in order to uh, you know in order to be able to effectively bring uh, everyone on the table. Uh, you know, with that said, you know, I did want to mention that we have seen some very encouraging examples of uh, multi-stakeholder cooperation for good. So we've seen that in places like Nigeria with their uh, digital rights bill. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar, it is a piece of legislation that was passed by the Senate in Nigeria that guarantees users some uh, basic rights and access to the internet. And this is something that was um, initiated by civil society, but obviously it needed to receive support by the government and, you know, it eventually received the support of the private sector. So it is something that, you know, is a concrete piece of legislation that can be used as a good example. We've seen that in some other countries, like for example, the country of Georgia, uh, you know, when uh, the government decided to uh, institute access to the internet as uh, a part of their new constitution. And again, this came as an initiative by civil society that worked together with government and then they were able to get support by the technical community. So again, I, I do think that there are some really good examples, but the bottom line is that uh, most of those countries are, uh, have such political environments where such multi-stakeholderism is possible and, you know, and unfortunately that's not the case in, in uh, much of the world. Thank you, Sander. So, um, I would like to ask, um, the Im I will, I, so we need an input from the audience, uh, like it is from the each stakeholder. So the, how about business sector in the audiences? How do you think about this problem? Or technical community? No? <laughs> or also civil society, that's fine. Oh, okay. So um, please go ahead. So I think this question of policy discussions, you, you can approach it directly through uh, internet related discussions and uh, I think what's important then is to have this holistic perspective because if it's just one issue you start talking about like copyright, it has implications for all these other issues, if it's security it has implications, if it's uh, accessibility. So uh, any discussions about internet needs to not just be focused on one issue but put it in, in the ecosystem of the internet because this is a, an integrated, interdependent uh, entity, and I think that's where these, this Rome model is useful. So that's one approach. The other approach, though, is to come to these internet uh, policy discussions through the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, because all governments have signed on to these goals, and so all governments should be, um, you know, engaged and, uh, and, and uh, be open to dialogue around the Sustainable Development Goals. And these goals are not just for the developing world, these are universal goals like combating climate change and gender equality achieving and so on. And uh, people here may know that, or may not know, that there is a goal 1610, uh, which is public access to information and fundamental freedoms. Now like some other goals, for example, goal on gender equality, goal on education, these are goals that can really uh, impact on the achievement of all other goals. 
because if you, you know, if you don't have gender equality, you don't have education, it's very hard to see how you're going to have sustainable cities or uh, life uh, uh, under the ocean and so on. So I, I think that the Sustainable uh, Goal 1610, public access to information and fundamental freedoms, as part of the SDG package uh, and a real enabler of achieving those other SDGs, this really gives an imp uh, 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 a lever to engage governments on internet issues because how can you have public access to information and fundamental freedoms without uh, this, an internet that is respecting rights, is open, is accessible and multi-stakeholder. So I, I think if anybody hasn't tried that, this is really, it's a very important dialogue and not just for the sake of the internet but for the sake of humanity because if we don't have sustainable development um, achieved, we're just going to see uh, continuing strife, warfare, conflict and, uh, and environmental degradation to the point of, of no return. Uh, so thank, uh, thank you for your comments, um, Guy. Um, so um, I'm from Japan and uh, in our environment, uh, lots of Japanese governments and also our business sector um, like set a goal to accomplish SDGs. So it, yeah, it, as Guy said, like uh, it can be some common sense for uh, like different stakeholders. I think. Oh, uh, actually, it's not in response to you. But I was going to say, considering that we have Patrick from GNI here, and GNI is such a great multi-stakeholder initiative. Uh, with the private sector and civil society, uh, I guess two stakeholders there and some uh, academia. I wonder whether there are any lessons learned from GNI model that we can apply elsewhere. Uh, I, I agree, GNI uh, being a great uh, initiative, and we work hard with many challenging issues. I think uh, GNI has a huge potential. Uh, but it's also difficult to work with 50-plus uh, uh, um, strong organizations. So uh, uh, we need to continue to do good work. Um, uh, I don't really know what the more exact question was. Uh, so if you could repeat that to me, maybe I can be more constructive. I was just wondering whether there are any lessons learned from GNI model about uh, multi-stakeholder uh, policy discussions on how to best uh, how to best uh, to reach that agreement among different uh, stakeholders on contentious issues, whether that be uh, countering violent extremism or copyright, and all of these are obviously very uh, very heated debates uh, where people have divergent issue, uh, divergent point of views. Thank you. So yes, what GNI definitely provides is. Uh, uh, safe uh, space for more open discussions on, as you say, sometimes very challenging issues where uh, very often we see that we have joint interests, joint uh, goals, and uh, when we uh, meet uh, and learn and uh, get to know each other and get to know that we have these same aims, we can get more um, uh, hands-on to the problems and, and, and discuss more constructively. Uh, I think that's a big win and uh, 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 something that the GNI provides within the GNI uh, community. Thanks. Okay, um, my I still wanted to highlight the issue of uh, most stakeholder discussions. Um, on a personal level, what I've observed in, in, a, in our region, say in Africa, is that uh, most of the times conversations around uh, the private sector would be between private sector or technical community and government. You know, the civil society voice or other stakeholders' uh, voices are usually not represented, like Sanya said. And uh, in terms of, say, what Jenna is doing, I find that at times most of the conversations that we have kind of, you know, stay more at the global level and we need to reach out more to the regional levels where there are more threats to the internet. 
for instance, say in Africa, I'm not so sure how many representatives, say, from the private sector are from uh, on the GNI, you know, in the GNI network, are from Africa. Because if we could have more of these voices, and then we would be able to, I know from civil society there are a couple of representatives from Africa, but from the business and private sector, how do we get more of these voices to be able to come and engage with the governments? Sorry to put you on the spot, but... Uh... Yes, if I can uh, answer that, of course, uh, GNI uh, is, is an open organization, open for membership applications, uh, but me uh, GNI membership also goes with uh, uh, quite some commitments on, on, you know, there is a membership fee and there are commitments uh, to undergo uh, external assurance, etc. So uh, uh, we are open for other companies to join, uh, but it comes with commitments and uh, companies, operators, and uh, OTTs outside of the GNI need to answer themselves if they are ready to take these commitments. Uh, and then there is a process for membership application, etc., which contains all of the four constituencies of GNI uh, to see if, if, if a company is eligible for, for membership. But uh, a, 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 um, a strong idea, of course, with the GNI as such, uh, which you imply with your question, is that the more members, uh, both civil society, academics, uh, and uh, investors, NGOs, and companies, the more we are, the more leverage, of course, there is to address uh, the issues. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Marian. Uh, so I think we have more, just five minutes or <laughs> five minutes left. So I want to uh, move on to the wrap up this workshop. So uh, as a wrap up, um, I would like to ask the um, one person um, from each stakeholder. I would like to ask: So what is the positive effect, positive um, impact of the this, the free up internet in your stakeholder? And um, I appreciate if somebody in, from the audience can speak about this. But if there is none, um, I want to ask the speakers from here. So do, do you want, anyone want to appeal the positive effect from your stakeholder? OK, so just. Um, so just one minute from his <laughs> <Okay>. speakers. <laughs> right, I can, I can start. I mean, um, for me right now, representing technical community, of course, when uh, the internet is open, I'm not so sure about the free aspect, free to what level, but if it's open and accessible for everyone, the more profit, the more, you know, operations will, will go on. And, you know, the more people are connected, the more people connect, the more benefits and, you know, um, Income. But also, I also wanted to, to mention that um, there's this global campaign of keeping it on that is current, you know, ongoing from the Internet Society is part of this campaign. So I would just um, appreciate, you know, everyone to just go to the hashtag, keep it on and, you know, continue pushing against, you know, Internet shutdowns. Actually, right now in Uganda this week, we have, uh, there was a case on... Um, on the internet shutdown in 2016, and there's a court hearing this, this week. And so if we can push more and push our government to keep it on, probably other governments can also keep copy if we win this case. Yeah. Thank you. So, Tanya, you know, stay in one minute. Well, for, for civil society, <laughs> internet uh, has been essential in the ability to push for greater rights and we've seen that in some of the most challenging more repressive most repressive environments so even places in places like saudi arabia because of online campaigns uh, we've seen the right to drive to flourish, for example, or we've seen some of the public authorities being brought to justice. Uh, in places like Russia, because of citizens going on YouTube to talk about corruption, we, for the first time, would see 
actual reaction from the authorities. So we've seen uh, internet really uh, bringing rights <clears throat> and realization of those rights to the next level, but uh, as a result of that, we've unfortunately also seen suppression. But I think I remain an optimist, so I do think that open uh, internet will be essential uh, for our human rights. Thank you, so Thomas. Well, I'm rather optimistic as well, and I think the Internet is simply the greatest tool for everybody to share and to publish, actually. Anybody can be a publisher, and I'm personally hopeful also that this asymmetry that we see between downloads and uploads is about to change, because I think it's very important that not just blockbuster contents are being consumed by millions, which are identical contents, uh, I think there's a huge potential for more diversity, and I'm hoping the development is going in that direction. Thank you, Sokai. Well, I, I share the optimism of colleagues here, and I think that if we see that the Internet is this most marvelous instrument for free flow of communication, and that should be the default setting, then it means that any limitations uh, should be, according to international standards, they must be absolutely necessary, they must be proportionate to the purpose, and the purpose must be legitimate. And so I think it's important to keep making that, uh, that, that call, that any limitations should be the exception and should have to be justified. You cannot have a, a free flow of ideas and understanding and knowledge, uh, free journalism, if you don't uh, uh, put some limitations on any limitations. So any regulators or governments who are wanting to regulate need to look at this value of the international standards, necessity, proportionality, and legitimate purpose. Thank you. So Oliver? So I would also agree with the, the colleagues on the fact that the uh, Internet is really a, a great uh, platform for uh, uh, open debate and uh, innovation, and we need it to... Uh, have uh, economic growth and to improve uh, uh, the, the, the way the society works. At the same time, I, I think there are needs for uh, specific protection, and I would agree with uh, Guy here that it needs to be necessary and it needs to be uh, proportionate. And when we go into uh, such uh, safeguard measures, we should not go as government in a top-down manner, but we should really involve the multi-stakeholder community and its different constituencies. Uh, to make sure that we address uh, their, their worries and, and we produce better rules or better codes of uh, practices. And I think uh, this is really a joint uh, responsibility. This is something we should do together and not, uh, only, it's not on, it doesn't only rest on the, on the governments. Sorry, so f uh, from the organizer. Um, so I'm also representing the youth. And uh, so I think the, the to um, realize the free, free, the open, the free internet. Uh, but we we also take the responsibility, and also um, work on the rule making. So I think the multi stakeholder um, discussion is essential uh, for this kind of issues. So I would like to um, continue to um, seek the how to um, include the like business take, business and tech community and how to connect the those all uh, stakeholder and the policy makers and the youth can be bridge um, to connect each stakeholder I believe so that's why I organized this workshop here so um finally um I, I'm very, um, I want to thank you to all of these participants in this room. Um, I'm very glad to include all of, all of you here. So um, if you have any comments or opinion, um, please let me share after this workshop. Thank you. That's all.